Well, greetings, everyone. I am very honored and excited today to be interviewing Rory Duff. And let me just give you a little bit of background about Rory, and then we're going to dive into uh, a deep conversation about the energy lines on the earth and how they're impacting us and how they relate to this profound time of transformation that we're in. So Rory initially began his work as a geologist in the gold mines in Africa. And one of the things I really respect about you, Rory, is how your vocational path has been guided by synchronicities from the beginning. Um, while in Africa, Rory learned about Rudolf Steiner's work and has been very impacted by that, and also began his exploration and work as a dowser. Um, he then moved back to the UK to pursue a career in coaching and training, and now defines himself as a geobiologist, exploring the study of how the earth and earth energies affect life. Rory is a leading pioneer in the understanding of ley lines and earth energies and was the first to rediscover the most powerful lines in the world, the emperor dragon lines. He's also been a pioneer in developing the scientific understanding of the origins of these energies, their relationship with sound waves, and how they relate to universal or cosmic consciousness. And we could have a whole conversation about your work with Ron Pearson and understanding of the creation of the universe, but <laughs> we, we could go in so many directions. Um, but I also want everyone to know that Rory has written several books, um, including Grail Found, about his understanding of the Templar's search for the Holy Grail, and that could be a whole three-hour conversation. And the book that I'd like to focus more on today is Grail Bound, which is an in-depth exploration of the ley lines and earth energies and how the shifts in these energies in recent years relate to ancient prophecies about our movement into the new age or new world. Rory is also a leader in guiding others in how we can work with these energies in this profound time of change and is doing an enormous amount of work to be supporting worldwide efforts to work with these energy lines. And uh, his website is roryduff.com and I'll include that below this uh, interview when we upload it on YouTube. So thank you, Rory, for being here and being in this conversation today. Well, thank you, Heather, and thank you for that very nice introduction. <laughs> it's much appreciated. So I'd love to start and just uh, with your overview or summary of the different ley lines and energy lines and uh, how they uh, play out on the earth. Okay. Um, perhaps the, the, the way to start this was, was uh, initially looking at uh, uh, energy lines and, and the ones that I started with was were originally mapped by a, a, a quite a well-known dowser called Hamish Miller who, who mapped a very uh, strong alignment running up the uh, from Cornwall in southwest England up to East Anglia and this alignment uh, or lay or lay line it's all the same thing different 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 names for it has a pair of earth energies running alongside it called the St. Michael line and the St. Mary line. And my interest when I, when I came back to this country was, since I'd been dowsing for water, I thought, well, if I can douse for water, I'll douse for these lines to see if I can find them. So I was, I was mapping these lines for some time. And uh, at, at some point I, I, I found that there were other places that might have these energy lines. And so I started tracking these lines um, and I noticed at, at this point, at a, at, a, at a later stage that the the lines ran quite close to where I lived and every morning I noticed that where this line was wasn't quite at the same place at the same time of day and I know because I used to walk my dog for the same journey at eight o'clock in the morning and I would have a quick look at where this line was at eight o'clock exactly and uh, it was never quite the same so I thought well okay well 
what's happening here. So I measured it accurately with a, a tape measure and I set a, a, a point of data in the, in, the, in the soil and literally measured to the inch where this line edge was at eight o'clock every day. I did that for about 70 days. Um, and I began to find it sort of drifted backwards and forwards. And then the next stage was I really needed, oh yeah, that, at that point I realized that when there was a full moon or a new moon, that, that this shift had moved a bit further to the, to, the, to the north or the south on this particular east-west line. So that maybe the, maybe the moon has got some influence on this. And I ended up having to then look, okay, well, maybe I should measure this edge more than every 24 hours. So I measured, started measuring every hour where this edge was. And that's when this whole thing hit me. I thought, oh my goodness, this thing is moving one way and then it's moving the other way. And I'm thinking, well, why hasn't anyone seen this before? And, and that led to the understanding, well, actually I'm, I'm in the middle of nowhere compared to all the interesting sacred sites that people ask, you know, you know to Avebury and Glastonbury. So uh, the, the, these are nodes where what we know now is the energy lines all come together and where they come together, they're fixed in one place. So you can't see the movement. It's only when you're in the fields between everything. So you've got a, a node here and a node here. You have two energy lines running between the one node and another one, very much like your guitar string. If you're in the middle, you can actually see the guitar string or the, or the, the line move from side to side. So having discovered this, it was a matter of like being up all the time to just measure the frequencies of these lines. And I measured other lines and found these side to side movements of the line weren't all the same. Some were moving slightly faster than the others. But we're talking about a very slow movement, like six hours one way, six hours the other way. Then we discovered the Michael and Mary lines had like 12 hours movement one way, 12 hours movement the other way. And further, further on, I was looking at, well, are these lines all moving in the same direction? Like I said, I've got two different lines. But no, they were going out and back like this, out and back. So, and, and the other ones would be like this. So I was thinking, well, What's producing these things? How, how would you get this? And we, look, we looked at gravity and all the things that could possibly be this, but it had to be something which stemmed from the inside of the earth, because just like the magnetic poles rotate with the earth, okay, these lines rotated with the spin of the earth as well. So it had to mean that something inside the earth was coming out and expressing itself on the surface. And uh, it took a while to, to, to understand what that was, and I'll come to that, but, but essentially the, uh, there were groupings of lines with, with frequencies and movements. And, and, and these different groups uh, had their own signatures, and, and actually they had their own expressions of widths of lines as well. So it, was, it, it became possible to then classify them into different types of lines. So the Michael and Mary lines are typically what we call type four lines now, and there are slightly smaller, um, faster type three lines, and then type two lines, type one lines, and lines which connect with the moon, how the moon phases of the moon affect the, their movement, call them the moon phase lines. Um, and there are a few more in, in that sense, but then you've got the more surface orientated lines, which are more grid-like. They don't, they don't form nodes with lots of lines coming together. They, they form grids, like a grid pattern. Um, and we know them as the banker grids, the Hartman Curry grids, and also the hexagonal grid. And we've been uh, realizing that what produces these more surface structures, geometric structures, are, are connected more to the, uh, uh, the magnetic fields of the sun and the earth and how they interface. Uh, uh, typically, the interfacing of, of the fields produce uh, Birkeland currents. They go down into the ground uh, and produce ground induction currents, people call them telluric currents, but uh, uh, the, the scientists know that uh, some of these currents, for instance, uh, the Hall and Peterson currents have a north, south, east, west orientation. And this is exactly how we find the banker grid lines. They have a north, south, east, west, uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a three dimensional structure. It's not two dimensional. And then there's other, so they're, 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 these were more electromagnetic in nature, but they didn't explain these other lines, which noted in one point, and, and they had this backwards and forwards vibration. And we discovered later that that was down to the inner core of the earth. And I'll come to that in a minute. So uh, essentially we can differentiate between the lines by their nature, either electromagnetic or uh, vibrational, uh, very, very low vibration, subaudible, very, very, so if you think about to, um, Hertz, we're down to the rounds about 
six to seven microhertz. And when you think of one hertz is one movement to one side and back in a second. And then uh, two hertz is like two movements in a second. Well, this is like so slow. It's like point naught, 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 five of a second. And, and that's the slowness of it. Uh, so but by looking at the fact there were different groups of lines, we then, well, why? Why do we have some, some frequencies of, let's say, 14 hours frequencies, or some at 16 hour frequencies, some at 12, uh, and then some at 24, and then some at 36, but we have none at 22, 21, 19, 18, 17, none at uh, 28, 29. So there were gaps, as well as groupings in certain areas. And, and then it was discovered that the, within, a, within these groupings, and when you measure lots of them over time, they begin to come in a harmony. So looking at the, the, at the reason why, um, it, it became apparent that uh, something had to be uh, continually displaying this energy. So there had to be a continual source of energy supplying the constant presence of these energies on the surface. And, and after some time, it was uh, the most likely hypothesis was the electromagnetism that's naturally in the outer core of the earth was uh, being transduced by the natural transducer, which is the iron nickel solid inner core of the earth. So you've got a solid inner core, a bit like a beating heart in this liquid outer core. And a transducer converts one form of energy to another. And, and they make excellent things for turning uh, sound energy into electric energy uh, from microphones and back into speakers. It'll transduce uh, electromagnetics into sound. And I think what's happening with the iron core, which is a natural transducer, it was expanding and contracting the inner core within the outer core. In, in a way similar to the way uh, uh, a speaker expands and contracts and pushes out uh, air in high pressure, low pressure waves. But we've got the same underground where you've got these uh, spherical high pressure waves and a low pressure wave, and they're all expanding out to the surface. And just like a loudspeaker is playing lots of different sounds and frequencies, you find that uh, the inner core has another property called a mechanical filter, which actually filters out some of the frequencies it doesn't produce. So you've got natural gaps and it only produces frequencies at certain, certain levels. And that's what's producing the different uh, frequency energy lines on the surface. As the, if you think of a balloon uh, and a triangle on a balloon like this with a black, black indelible marker, you write that and you expand the balloon and then you contract the balloon, that black triangle will get bigger and then smaller. So if you think of that now being shone and projected on the surface of the earth, you can now see that these energy lines are expanding and contracting. But really what they are, are high pressure uh, linear concentrations of this uh, uh, spherical low vibrational energy coming out from the inner core. So uh, that doesn't explain everything at this surface, but it does explain what we're finding on the surface. But what then happens is, well, through, through studying where these patterns were and where they cross over, another phenomenon emerges is that where their intersections are, we find ancient and modern places of prayer. So you've got to ask, well, why? Okay, I mean, there's churches, cathedrals, and there's ancient stone circles and other places like that, that the Bronze Age people, the Stone Age people knew. Uh, and somehow the Templars also cottoned onto this. I think it's because of the secrets they found in, in, in Jerusalem, but we won't go there. That's in, in your first book. But the, they obviously found these very, very powerful intersections like at Chartres, Monsoon, and, and various other places and built their, their, their churches on top of ancient sacred sites as well, actually, um, because they knew that uh, if they built their, their dimensions of the church, in a certain way in the walls they would produce sound uh, at a certain frequency that held a standing wave that, between the walls a bit like an echo going backwards and forward and and, and if they got that frequency to match exactly the, the underlying frequencies that emanating from the inner core you create something called resonance and that resonant effect when you connect with your own body and, and make your own chance, then everything starts vibrating. And in fact, in, in, in Chartres Church uh, in France, where there's a labyrinth, the, the node is right in the middle of the labyrinth. And when all the, the, the energies are in harmony and you, you sound the right note, you, you can feel that vibration. And it still doesn't mention 
why it's significant though and that that to, to understand that is you're then taken down into the root of well okay what is what is vibration and what is what is driving this whole universe and at the moment the only theory of quantum gravity that makes any sense that uh, uh, that links all the different phenomena we find is Pearson's theory of quantum gravity. Um, the scientists don't like it because we don't need relativity theory, but I think relativity theory is, has just become a religion. And that'll be another story. But this, he, he talks about how intelligence had to arise first on a sub-quantum level. And, and it, could, it could direct its vibrations in such a way that when these vibrations interact, like two ripples in a pond, it creates a spike of energy and the illusion of a particle on the higher quantum level. So what you've then now got is a, a connection between vibration and universal consciousness. So if you've got something at the head center of our earth, which is expanding and contracting, sending out very low frequency vibrations, that is almost a, a direct line to communicating with the universal mind, or indeed uh, the other matter frequency worlds that the universal mind is also producing. And um, so that's the electromagnetic uh, of the earth that are producing the type three lines, type two lines, type one lines. But we then have the type four, the bigger lines. And we think that's uh, energy from the sun getting through to the earth and then pro projecting and emanating out a, 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 a much lower frequency energy lines. And then the fifth, uh, and and the, by the way, the type four are much rarer than the much more numerous smaller lines. And then we get, come to the rarest of them all, which, which took a while to understand what, where this source of energy might come from. And that is the, the emperor dragons, the type five lines. And, and back in 2012, when we, when we, when we recognized they, that they existed, um, we knew of only three of them. And um, at that point, we didn't quite know where this possible energy was coming from. But if it wasn't from the sun and it wasn't from the earth, the most obvious route was from uh, nearby galaxies. And the only thing, or active galactic nuclei, and anything that could be doing that, uh, that could be ca carrying that uh, energy and getting to the inner core is cosmic energy. That hits our atmosphere, changes to neutrinos. Neutrinos are high energy particles, travel almost all the way through the earth. Uh, they get slightly diffracted when they hit the inner core, that gives them the inner core, the energy, which can then be transduced into these very, very slow moving um, uh, waves of, of, of emanating waves of, of um, energy, which appear at the surface as these single uh, um, energy lines that we call the emperor dragons. Um, so that was, if the energy could get through, the cosmic energy had to get through all the interstellar uh, um, magnetic fields because magnetic fields will stop the cosmic energy. So, and, and this now, and, and they use um, uh, machines in, in uh, Antarctica to, to measure these neutrinos and neutrons as they come through the earth. And, and the way they're deflected, if you like, helps them build up an image of the interior of the earth. They call it something called a acoustic tomography. So that we know that they can actually pick up these neutrinos or uh, the Cherenkov radiation from them, which then gives them an idea of direction and, and, the, and the amount. But um, so the, the hypothesis is that the, the emperor dragons are caused by this constant feeding of neutrinos through to the inner core that being transduced. So there are the different types of, um, of, of the, the very low vibration type, type energy lines. And then you've got the electromagnetic ones, um, which are more like the grids. And, and then that kind of explains it on the way they're all different. But the, the, the consequences of that then come next, <laughs> once you've understood that. Yeah, it's profound in terms of, and having visited some of these ancient sacred sites, you can feel the energy of those nodes there. And, it, but talk a little bit more about how these emperor dragons, as you said, they're connected to, to the galactic energies, but how you really explored those nodal points and how much more potent they are in terms of their connection to these other frequencies, these other realms, and how they're changing, particularly since 2018. 
Yeah, it raises actually an interesting point. With with so many energy lines, there are huge numbers of intersections. So why aren't there more sacred sites everywhere? And then what you find is that the more significant sacred sites draw in more of the other energies. So you've got the type four lines, for instance, coming together and crossing over. Just two pairs of type four lines will attract eight, some to eight pairs of all the other lines. So it's it's a there there are some places which are much more significant than others. And, and the resulting places you find on them are generally uh, in the past or presently um, uh, evidenced by a lot of people having gathered there in the past. When you come to the emperor dragons, there really are, I mean, with, with the, the six pairs of emperor dragons, one, one is a sort of north-south meridian, which doesn't tend to sort of uh, work with the other ones in the same sort of way. But the other five, where they cross over, it, it's 20 places around the world. And around 13 of those places are in the oceans, the other seven are on land, but where they are on land are not just uh, dramatic places today, but they were dramatically energetic places in the past, which uh, in the one in Spain, for instance, which I mentioned in the book Grail Bound, uh, you can tell from the numbers of energy lines that cross over there, just from, from that aspect, it is phenomenally more powerful than any other place. And then typically the, the ones you'd know is like Mount Kailash, uh, um, other ones, um, this, this one in Peru, the um, Uluru in, in, um, in, in um, Australia is another, uh, what we call first order node. And there are a few which are fairly not known in, in other parts of the world, but locally they're known and they don't talk about them too much. So there's a, there's a, for instance, a very strong one in New Zealand and South Island. So um, coming back to your question about how they affect us, yes, you can move into them and sensitive people will immediately begin to dissense these images. Uh, something changes, something different. Um, and it, it does actually lead on to the physical effects of living on some of these different frequencies because you know, humans evolved in this environment with lots of frequencies, but there weren't so many of us back then. Uh, and, and natural evolution has shown us that we, we can live very easily on the majority of frequencies, but there's a there's one or two frequencies which just kind of like jar our cells a bit like a, a nasty sound can give us a, a, a jarring sound down the spine. And this is a, a lot to do with the, the, the geobiology of how, how does how does the earth affect life as well. Some of these frequencies don't affect us too well at all. Um, and, and that's can generate uh, ill health, chronic fatigue even things like cancers appear when you spend too long on some of these uh, intersections and some of these lines and that's one of the one of the areas of work we do is, is to, to to check people's locations whether or not uh, and, and there's remedies we can do but you, you don't really want to spend too long on some of these uh, places um, the difficulty is when you can't do anything because the place is so uh, heavily populated because moving a line it can, can affect somebody else on it but that's the sort of negative side on some of these lines, uh, but the positive side is that they can amplify emotions massively when you're on them, which if you're positive, it can really lead to being massively positive. Of course, if you're negative, it'll lead to ampli amplifying that. And if you then have water connected to these energies as well, that's a further amplification. So you can end up by, uh, if you have very high levels of expectation uh, and emotion, you, that intensity, begins to be very uh, fortuitous when you start looking at wanting to work on these energy lines for purposes like healing or communication or mediumship, um, because intense focus and intense awareness is really important to switch from the conscious mind to the subconscious and back again to, to have that sort of communication or to, to, to go into that state where essentially you're, you're um, looking to, 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 to manifest new realities, new, 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 new uh, forms of matter in somebody who's got perhaps diseased tissue and moving it to more of a eased tissue, as we know um, healers can do. So, so there's, there's the physical side, and I mentioned the emotional side because it, it amplifies negative emotions. And I know you, you were interested before in whether it affects the spiritual side when this is exactly what the Templars found. Uh, they were looking for spiritual enlightenment and uh, were thinking that the, the grail that they were looking for was the biggest intersection that they could find in Europe. And uh, they knew that uh, if they prayed and meditated on this place, then, then the chances of... of um, being lifted to a state of ecstasy where they're one with the universal was much much greater 
and that's what they were looking for. In fact, they 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 probably achieved that in several other places. There are there are chapels in and around Europe that have the uh, most divine feeling at, at certain times of the year that that will lift a person into uh, that state of enlightenment. And we know people in the past have, have expressed moments when they've when they felt this. Um, even even recently, there's a very powerful Type Four line we found running through uh, the the town just to the north west of Madrid of Avila, and this was uh, where it actually ran at the time through the monastery where Saint Teresa was uh, was was spending most of her life uh, with the Carmelite uh, monastery, uh, and, uh, and she was known for 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 her writings and and for <laughs> the rather awkward uh, effect of levitation <laughs> where uh, her, 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 her fellow nuns would have to pull her back down but that, that sort of state of ecstasy she wrote about in, in her stories and that that I think was very much linked to being on these powerful lines as well so, I, so it's I, really a, a, a these are energy centers for manifestation but also for spiritual expansion and connection to universal consciousness um, yeah. and other other um, frequencies, other worlds. Yeah, yeah, and and this is kind of like where we we kind of like got to the point. Well, okay, um, and, and somehow prophecies crept, crept in on this. <laughs> yes, please talk more about the amazing connections you made then yeah. between some of the shifts you were seeing in these energies well, and the prophecy. Yeah, it was. It came a bit out of the blue because uh, one of my friends. Um, said something about have you seen what's going on with the energies and this was back in 2017 and um, went out and, and, and measured the, the the lines and they'd all doubled in width and so I, I sent a message out to some, some core people that, are, that we're networked with and I said just check the lines today for you and, and tell me what you find and they all came back saying what's going on is but all these lines have just doubled in width um, <clears throat> so we started looking for possible reasons for this and uh, what eventually came by was that if, if we've got more energy, so the actual central band of the lines, is the, the lines have different bands, its central band of the lines is, is, is a solar band, it's connected to the sun and it was a central band that had widened much more than the other lines. So something had started coming from the sun which was much more significant than before and, and the only thing that scientifically was was explained by was, was actually cosmic energy coming from the sun that we know gets redirected from the sun back to the earth. So something had actually increased this this band. And that that kind of meant that the increase in cosmic energy had started coming through. That then led to the question: of, Well, why? Why are we suddenly getting increases in cosmic energy? And and then uh, and I know you. you, you, you spoken about this before and, and, and know about a little bit about it. We're, we're talking here about uh, the Earth going through, um, in the solar system, going through some major transitional changes. And what's been noticed by the likes of Ben Davidson from Sushish Observers and others is that our magnetic field is massively changing. Uh, it's uh, It used to be for many centuries hovering over Canada. It's now shot all the way across, this is the North magnetic North Pole, shot across the North Pole, heading towards the Russian coast. The magnetic South Pole has already left Antarctica. Um, so the pole positions are changing and the magnetic field is reducing. And the importance of the magnetic field reducing is that when you haven't got a magnetic field, more cosmic energy comes through. More cosmic energy comes through, then we've got more neutrinos. More neutrinos transduced more low, low, low frequency vibrations and therefore more energy is coming onto the surface. So um, what was then making our energy field, magnetic energy field reduce? And um, this is when it was beginning to, to realize that this was a cyclical thing, whereby uh, the solar system seemed to be passing through what's called the galactic current sheet roughly every 12,000 years. Now, the similarities between the galactic current sheet, which is like a wavy spiral, throughout the, 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 the galaxy and at our distance from it, our solar system, our distance from the center of the galaxy, our solar system passes through the, the sort of waves of this spiral, which is a, a plasma type uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, wave, if you like, 
we, we'll go through this every 12,000 years and it takes about 200 years to go through. We know quite a bit about this because of the similarity with our sun and our sun's heliospheric current sheet that our earth passes through and our distance from the earth we pass through it roughly every eight to ten days and it takes about two minutes to pass through and when it passes through we get a massive great jolt of electricity from the from the sun's current sheet that goes down into the inner core and like booms rings our, go our bell our inner core and it is picked up in the type three energy lines suddenly the type three lines come into harmony for those every eight to ten days they come into harmony for two days it's it's longer than two minutes because you can't stop a bell when it starts it keeps it keeps reverberating so we're going to be going through this this same well every twelve thousand years we're going to be hitting this same jolt of plasma that, that the earth does and it's going to be sending this massive uh energy to our inner core in our solar system and it's affecting planets and, and uh, all the way in our solar system already it's affecting other stars in our galaxy you can see this ripple having its effect as we get close to it but this is a cyclic event whereby our magnetic field is lowering cosmic rays are increasing and we know cosmic rays are mutational it, they, they, they kill cells mutate cells um, so it, it's going to be having an effect on human life i mean it, it, even now uh, in brazil where there's a magnetic low anomaly you've got uh, huge increases in cosmic energy but hitting the atmosphere above Brazil, that actually changes not just to neutrinos, but to gamma ray radiation. So when you've got increases in gamma radiation, you've got problems in Brazil. Typically, uh, the, the, the biggest health problem is inflammation of the lungs and, and, and organs. That's what radiation does. It's, it's similar to um, radiation therapy. Too much radiation therapy for cancer leads to inflammation of the lungs. It has to be treated with things like vitamin D, hydroxychloroquine and things like that. So the big lung inflammation and that's breathing difficulties and people having respiratory problems and dying from that are already happening in, in Brazil. But, but for people who are, uh, and this is unfortunately for people who aren't particularly healthy, but for healthy people, um, when you're fasting uh, and connecting with these energies, it has a very positive effect of um, of beginning to reawaken dormant cells and, 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 and possibilities that, that uh, we haven't had for 12,000 years. I'm talking about increasing things like telepathy, empathy, clairaudience, clairvoyance. Uh, and, and this is a great awakening. And it's like a spiritual awakening, which we seem to go through every 12,000 years. And there's and now when you have something cyclic, you can begin to understand how prophecies can work. Because scientifically, how do you get your head around prophecies? How can, how can mankind see the future? It was the one biggest thing that Jung had a problem with. Jung, when he did his, he, when he did his in, uh, in, in visualization exercises back in uh, 1912 to 1918, 1918 he, he wrote all his notes in, this, in these black books about what he was discovering with his inner visualizations. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it completely shocked him. And it, 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 it only, only recently, I mean, he died in the, roughly in the 1960s, and then not until... 2009 were his, did his red book get published and we started seeing the paintings he'd drawn about what he'd seen and then his his text and that he'd written about how his 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 he was shocked to the core with some of these things and and one of the things was he began to realize this is Jung, the well-known psychoanalyst he was he knew he was a prophet he had seen visions of world war one Okay. And he said, he wrote, he said, if I hadn't seen it actually come out in practice and then realized I wasn't making it up and I knew this had happened, he wouldn't have continued his explorations. He was about to give it up and he was getting to the point where he was like completely feeling crazy by this. How, how, right, how right is it for any man to know the future? So you're left. Okay, so people like Jung, and we know other people who are prophets in the Bible. Look how many we have even uh, things called prophets in the Bible. Why do we call them prophets? Because prophecy was a was 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 something known about. The ancients used to rely upon it. So our ability to see the future, well, you can maybe get the idea that you can read a multitude of people's minds and think about what they're doing. So you get that short-term probability game that the, the universal mind and connecting with beings have an idea of what people are thinking and therefore what they're gonna be doing. And that can give you a sort of short-term idea of the future. And there's some great people who can do that. But on the long-term, how can you tell what's going on, you know, thousands of years ahead, unless there's something cyclic. 
happening to the whole of mankind that that's sort of embedded within within the psyche of mine uh, up through the soul of mankind uh, and and through the legends that are told and then through a variety of prophets who are getting the information about the coming changes and the transitions that are made over these great cycles of time and we see we see glimpses of people talking about these these uh, great cycles and prophets and then we the quero Indian prophecy, the Hopi Indian prophecy, the, the Mary Treya prophecy, uh, and, and the list goes on. The numbers of people get even young. He talked about seeing uh, a, an image which was uh, being told about the, the veil between the worlds coming down and the union with all humanity. Uh, they just they, when you start looking for these, these, these and even Revelations, and John it was talking about the same uh, a, a point in time in our future, and we think you now it's linked to this galactic current sheet and our passage through it. And even Steiner talked about moving from individual consciousness to group consciousness over great cycles. And we're now looking at, actually we're moving into this group consciousness again. So what do we do? And, and how, how, do, how does connecting with these energies help? And what should we do? And, uh, and that, that became the study that we're doing now really um, with our discussion groups on preparing for this and how we prepare because it's not, we can't individually do it now, we have to do it, in, it collectively. We must do it at these uh, these sacred sites where the energy is strong. So coming exactly. back to these energy, sorry, go Before on. Before we get into that, Rory, just to, to back up to what you're saying, because I think this is so important. These, these huge cycles, and it feels to me from my own research that some of these ancient cultures were more in tune with these large cycles than we have been in the last few thousand years and that they encoded the messages of these cycles in their ancient sacred sites, in the monuments, like you see in the pyramids um, in Giza, and that they were, you know, and, and this is a whole other topic we could talk about at some point, because I see that as really paralleling my re research with the processional cycle, the 24,000 year processional cycle, and how at the end of that cycle and the midpoint, yeah. we hit these times of change. But yeah. I just want to circle back to what you were talking about, about how these cosmic energies and how they get uh, come through the sun also are intensifying because, and this is where you and I both know Ben Davidson's work well, three protective shields are, are yeah. reducing right yeah. now. The Earth's yeah. magnetic field, the sun's magnetic field, and we're moving in space out of the local cloud yeah. out of that magnetic protective field yeah. into more exposure with these cosmic energies and that they yeah. activate these profound changes that you're talking about and how part of what I find fascinating that you really touch on in your work is how as we go through these larger cycles there are periods when we're more buffered by those magnetic shields and you've talked about how the emperor dragon lines, some of them switch off, or mm -hmm. we don't have those powerful nodes yeah. in the same way anymore. And it affects yeah. our spiritual consciousness. We end up feeling more disconnected from yeah. that universal or cosmic consciousness. But yeah. now what's profound in what you've been tracking with these earth energies, it's all opening up again yeah. Yeah. and helping us remember who yeah. we are and come back into connection with universal yeah. consciousness. Uh, absolutely, and, and, and the Quero in, in, in South America have, have this, uh, these expressions of the gateways to the ancestors and then there's gateways to the gods. And they were, they were talking about these gateways opening and closing over great cycles of time. And they, would, they weren't them, obvious. Profound their sense of this time, yes. Yeah, and in, in some ways we've got this uh, very uh, predictable passage of the solar system around the galaxy. But then you do have this unpredictable nature of the local interstellar clouds, which also yeah. shift. So there's, there's that, that, that makes it quite hard with, in regards to when things happen and timing. Now, there's another aspect which is difficult with timing is, is that if, if you're if you're looking at uh, our world with a particular, our particular perception of linear time time is not quite the same in the other worlds mm -hmm. and, and this concept of moving from uh, individual consciousness to group consciousness there is a, a 
quite likely to be a perception of time difference. I mean, we have to look at the Bible and, and uh, other uh, religions talking about people reaching eight years of 700 years old or 900 years old, then their, their time time con perceptions is a bit, a bit uh, up in the air a little bit there. But, but also, um, you, you're right to say about the, the, the ancients about leaving messages for us. And I, 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 just imagine here now the people who have spent you know, maybe 500 years in group consciousness with all the benefits of being in that wonderful age and a previous Satya Yuga maybe, and then starting to come out of that back into individual consciousness again. And that's oh, great okay. separation would have been terrifying to people. Yeah. yeah. And they would be wanting to try and find ways to, to write about this for the future. And to leave it to see people would know about this, but also finding ways of how to keep that connection going. So there's this period which could be described as the sort of destructive period, and then the building creative period again, and then the destructive period. And so you 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 can begin to see how the yugas originated when the first mention of them is in the um, the Rig Veda, and again at later in, a, a little bit how they, they they have these cycles mentioned in, and the in, in the ascending later. cycle, and then the descending cycle. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, then Sri Yukatswa are saying exactly that in every 12,000 years, and that links to the 24,000 years. But we can't be, we can't be 100% rigidly thinking about the timescales that have been, because we have to now think about the timescales ahead of us. Because we're, we're, we're looking at now a long-term prophecy connected to the cycles of, of this, moving into our very short term. And Steiner was talking about he was preparing the souls of the people he was in front of him in his audience. So they, when they were reborn again, they were ready for this. So we, we could be the ones we're waiting for who now have to connect and learn how to, 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 to foresee what's going to happen ourselves. We have to become prophets so that we get the very early warning to know what we've got to do. Well, and some of what he talked about, which from my perspective fits so much from an astrological understanding of the movement into the age of Aquarius, he talked so much about the need to retain that individual consciousness as we move into this spiritual group consciousness and how then it can lead us not only into that spiritual expansion, but this new way of being in connection and community with each other. Um, Absolutely, this, this, this development right now in this epoch, the fifth epoch that Steiner talks about is the development of the consciousness self. But as we move into the sixth epoch, he talks about how we need to now move towards the goal of the spiritual self. And, and, and here, we're, what, we're, what we seem to think is that if we aren't able to navigate ourselves within this new energetic environment, we aren't able to help other people. If you think about moving to group consciousness where you can hear everybody and feel everybody and, and, and see everybody, it's like, how, how do you know where you are in relation to everything else? Unless you can, you, you can step outside of that and navigate, you can't begin to help the ones who can't do that. And that's the, the, the true nature of, of learning, if you like, is, is, is leads us to this state of love. And, and, and all you can do then is, is do the angels, what the angels do, which is just send love, heart-centered love. So it's that process of learning how to, to, to differentiate ourselves as the individual, if you like. Re retaining all that we've remembered in individual consciousness rather than forgetting it so that we can in a discerning way help others who haven't managed to do that and that is the the, the role of where we have to go and that's how we then develop our spiritual selves in the next epoch getting a bit yes, deep here and, yeah. and i think that part of that involves and this is a major theme in my work that we we are all encouraged to be on an accelerated healing process so that we're not caught in our own trauma or projecting unresolved issues onto each other. Because you talk a lot about how the strengthening of these energy lines can intensify whatever emotions we have. So the more that we heal and get centered in ourselves, the more yeah. we've been open to that spiritual expansiveness and that love, and then hold that energy for others. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and again, you can return to Steiner and, and Jung as well with regards to their experiences when they are going on these incubatory journeys from one world into another world, the world of spirit. Uh, Steiner talks about crossing the abyss, you know, and, and, and Goethe, it, it's referred to as, as, in his fairy tale as the river, uh, and, and, and again, symbolically drawn as a river in Jung's images. Uh, and, and this is this abyss between worlds is like where you get tested. And, and, and your weaknesses are tested more than anything else to build up your strengths. And, and, and mankind right now is being tested. And, and I think that's the way because the, the veils between the worlds are coming down. One of the things we, we've discovered is um, every, every four times in the year, all these frequencies started coming into harmony. And, and the lines all started moving perfectly in sync with each other. And, and um, we've been measuring these harmony times. They always began the day before the solstices and the equinoxes. And they all lasted about half a day, maybe a bit longer. But since uh, 2017, when this extra energy came through, and, and then these three more emperor dragons popped up because the sources suddenly could get through the, the, the shields of the magnetic fields. So suddenly we had a huge extra influx of energies. Um, um, out of step now, going too, too, too far in one direction. So uh, we're, we're talking about the harmony times, that's it. And, and, and how to work with that. Yeah, the, apart from just the width of the energies increasing and the, and the power of them, we found that the harmony times started extending their time. They went to one and a half days long before they went out of sync again. And then it, they went to uh, three days long. And the the duration of the frequencies, when the frequencies were a common frequency of 10 hours or 12 hours or 14 hours, now we were finding the common frequencies were 20, 24 hours and the frequencies of the larger lines were the ones with the common ones. And right now, with, since then, we, with, with this last harmony time, the, the harmony period is 14 days long with the 72 hour frequency. Wow, that's a huge shift. Yeah, and, and when you see the energy lines and the formations at the intersections, the, the, there's such a strong uh, pull on all of the, the, the lines in harmony that the vortex within the, the cylinder of energy is so strong it collapses the energy into a double torus and inside that you get a vortex there. And that's the grail shape, the cup shape which people see, which sits almost below the ground, uh, the cauldron-like shape of energy. And so you meditate inside of this and, and literally well, everyone will know that have their meditations or prayer techniques. That, that's the, the one, the, the unifying thing in mankind that's common to all religions is this core spirituality. And, 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 and the key here for, for what, what we need to overcome is, is this divisiveness that's being thrust upon us. And we can do that by just coming together spiritually and, and recognizing the, the, the insignificance of each person as well as their background and their culture. And, and multi-faith group meditation at these sites at the time of harmony it is the way forward. But, but coming back to the harmony periods, at the 14 days long, you can extrapolate when and how soon it's going to be 97 days long, pretty much all year round harmony. Wow. What, what's your sense of the timing of that with how you- December you're... 2024. Now, I'm not saying anything's going to happen at that time, but, the, but, but the, the, because we're building up to this, the waves are increasing as, as, we, as the solar system comes towards the galactic current sheet, but the bow waves are hitting us more and more frequently. The energies are ramping up and we're slowly going on this journey of getting used to it. You know, even when now feeling in the middle of the night, you can wake up and get little fibrillations in your heart. Uh, and, and people are getting um, in the dream groups, we're in meditation groups, but the greatest synchronicity is this greater amount of commonality in message and symbolism is this that you can feel that the 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 interconnectivity is building and growing as empathy grows and, and between us all and, and telepathy begins to grow you mean you, you uh, and also time begins to begin a bit strange did you think that first or did i think that first it's like <laughs> there's, there's a fusion going on but we're building up to the point where we we are learning to work with a, a particular one frequency and that one frequency is like this big dong is going to hit our earth in the center and it's going to vibrate probably for 500 years, pushing out the same frequency. That's going to give us a wonderful chance to, to, to really learn how to uh, create sound, 
that is regularly going to resonate and help us resonate. So that every time we go to, to one of these sacred sites, which is going to be buzzing all the time, we just play that sound and we're going to connect and be able to open the portals and, 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 and connect with the, the beings in the other worlds or whatever we're supposed to be doing. But that's our learning chances are going to be dramatically increased at 2024. What we have to do now is get to 2024 in one shape. <laughs> and, and I, I <laughs> that's, think that's the key. <laughs> The, the negativity, the chaos, the divisiveness that we're going through is like mankind's own dark night of the soul, if you like, where yeah, we're crossing deeper. the abyss. Yeah, where, where we're being uh, tested by the three beasts that, uh, that, that Jung, uh, that Sina talks about, and, and that Jung encountered with the spirit of the depths and the spirit of time and, 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 and uh, his own soul. Who, who this, the, these are the challenges we're, we're collectively going through. If we can rise above that by staying positive and coming together, we'll be fine. Well, and part of what's so profound about your work is that it's really guiding us to see the deeper meaning of what's going on in this transition time and how it can be activating more extreme emotions. But if we understand the transformation that we're in, and, and I want to circle back in a minute to more of your guidance about how we can practice and work with these energies, it, it's helping us move through this transition in a more healing way rather than increasing the polarization, chaos, extremism that we're also seeing on yeah. the planet. But what's also remarkable is you see this shift really coming in December 2024, which from an astrological perspective is when Pluto moves into Aquarius and I see as the really crossing the threshold into the Aquarian age. So it's an interesting synchronicity that it lands in the same yeah. time. Yeah, and Pluto being very transformational, I'm told. And it's I'm really about the evolution of our soul individually yeah. and collectively. I, I do need to pick you up on one thing though, and it's not, it's not a big thing, but the, this understanding of, of science and what's happening is something we're gonna have to give up. Yes, yes, <laughs> the, yes. The, please say more about that, yes. The, the, the idea that we know what's going on, we don't. We are in the dark. We have to discover so much more in order to be able to keep this going. And, and, and it's that challenge of, of moving, and my groups, are, I'm helping people to work with groups and set up groups to, to literally know how we, we move from focus state to awareness state and how we have to just get away from the curiosity, getting away from the desire to know what we want to know from our ego, to just being given what we need to be given, to just desire the fire for the truth, the intent and the will has to be there and be given what we were supposed to be given like, like servants and they're just relying upon the, as Jim calls it, the numinous, the beings who are there to help us. So we and can't- shift from left brain thinking to right brain yeah, thinking. Yeah, that, that, that as well. Uh, uh, but, but it's it's our desire for something that's our weakness because it, it belies the fear that's underneath it. And it's, it's, we have to lose those fears. And, we, and it's that point of surrender, which Jung draws so beautifully well. He finally surrenders and sees that everything he expected was not what he expected. <laughs> as, he, as he crosses, he just like, well, all those, you know, so we, we, we mustn't think too much. I just let it happen. And that's why synchronicity is so good, because it's if you, if, you, if you just ask for synchronicity and to be guided, then each of us will play a part. It's not about everyone doing the same thing. And that's the other thing about being individuals. Uh, we, we, we recognize that, that, that group energy work is different. Group meditation is different from individual meditation. Group energy work is where we have to learn who we are and what we can do for the benefits of the group rather than being all the same. And that's yes, a journey so we're on. Say more about that, Rory, because I found that fascinating when you talk about what happens when you gather these groups at these harmony points, the solstices and equinoxes, and how you found it was critical that people be different and how, say a little bit about how you saw people form a natural circle at those sites. It, it kind of started in a surprising way because we I had a group of people, I was at, at, at there were some more advanced houses uh, and I was asking them to each find where they found the center of these two lines. And 
to stand exactly where you find these two lines crossing in the middle of this node. And what we found, we were exactly in a circle, about a yard and a half around. And we, we just looked at each other, thought, oh, that's interesting. So we each find ourselves in, we did the same exercise an, an hour later at a different node. And all of us going our own way, finding that the lines are centers. We ended up exactly in the same circle, same positions around the circle. And yet, why would we all find that the center slightly different? We did the thing again with other groups, and we would find two people trying to stand on one place and an empty place somewhere else. So we've begun to realize that there are innate differences in human beings that were purposely positioning on a different part of the circle, as though to make the circle we needed six different types of people. It's a bit like the alcoves you find in the center of the, of the labyrinth as well. There are six alcoves in, 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 uh, in, in Chartres, almost as though they knew the important significance of six different types of, of uh, individual had to be part in the presence. Then it sort of progressed on, we realized actually that, uh, that some people have an, an, uh, an easier way of working with these energies. Some people really resonated with connecting with vortices more. Some people could, could balance the upward and downward energy. So they would sense when the group is bringing too much energy down or too much energy up and they could rebalance it. And there's a sort of uh, working with the levels of energy and the balance of it and, and, and the allowing a vertical movement of energy. And then you've got other people who I know from when we went to Spain, uh, Tim had a very vital role and he didn't understand it to begin with, but he knew he was an anchor. He could hold an energy in his solar plexus such that he wouldn't move. So we were practicing on how he could build that skill up. Mm -hmm. uh, the really strange thing about when you're moving an emperor dragon, <laughs> you can't do it on your own as well, is, is uh, they, they're different from all the other energy lines. When you bring them close together, they repel. Uh, interesting. Interesting. They did the two. The like two didn't want magnets, to come together. Ends of the magnets. So, yeah, they didn't want to come together, and and that's why we couldn't do it on our own. And why everybody in the other worlds had to kind of like come together and do this. And by the way, you know, anyone who's who's not looked at the new science when I talk about other worlds, they're all in the same space, uh, different frequencies of matter. It, it's it's supported by by Pearson's work. So you know, I'm not totally crazy by thinking of other and, and I, I don't think of aliens being out, out, out of planets it's all about different people and different, different frequencies in the yeah, same okay. same area yeah. Of, of, of yeah so so there were beings doing things we couldn't do that's it but, but by by having by holding an energy line in one place you can then bring another one to it and and and, and work so there are things that you can do to anchor energy um, and there are things you can do to, to, to move it around and balance it. And, and it's that interlocking play of energy movement um, that is plain that you can see uh, um, held in the memory of the old dances in the shamanic religions found all around the world. Oh, and, and I, 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 I traveled to, to California a couple of years ago. And one of the reasons to go there was to meet a lady who had been in a long line of uh, Polynesian sh shamans. And, and she, she was the last in the line who'd been told how to do these ritual dances around these energies and, and, and watching how her role that she was taught was playing a part of this in, 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 in preparing the energy of the site for what was to come. And, and it's all about the dance and the movement to, to prepare the energies. And, and, and uh, mystics like, uh, Peter Junoff, the Bulgarian incredible uh, writer who, who st started uh, something called Pan Eurythmy, which is similar to Steiner's Eurythmy, which is a form of energy and movement and dance, where you use your mind with intent to, to move with the energies. And, you, and, and if you get it right, and, and you just, you're in a circle, and you, you just, for instance, close your eyes and you just move with the flow of the energy. If you get it right, you find that the people mirroring on the other side are doing the same movements as you are. And, and, and there's, there's almost like an intuitive building up of the exactly precise moment of knowing when to do what, if you surrender to that, 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 that intuition to just move as, as, as you're directed, as the, the energy dictates. And, and the progression, as I see it from that, when we learn more, 
is how to to unlock that energy puzzle if you like at, at these these places and, and groups will find their own ways the, the key is to get groups to start working together dream groups meditation groups discussion groups and, and that's that's where i'm planning to to, to take things with the uh, a new website that's being designed to be completely interactive that shows people where their local energy sites are and uh, allows people to to form groups build groups and, and provides the, the the way to communicate with each other that that's in the offering at the moment which uh, hopefully will be out in, in a few months time but um yeah that would be amazing rory because and, and i know this is a lot of what your work is about now that as we can gather on these sites around these for uh, harmonic times, the solstice yeah. of the equinoxes, then we're not only helping ourselves really be in attunement with the shifts that are happening, but we are supporting the shifts in the collective consciousness. Because yeah. tied in with what you were saying before, part of my experience, my own personal experience is um, my dreams have been changing dramatically. I feel more <laughs> that fluidity of our own um, psyche and the collective consciousness. So I'm often feeling like I'm having someone else's dreams. I'm having dreams that are my merging with the collective consciousness. And you've talked about this too. It can leave us feeling more like our dreams are reality and reality is a dream. If, if that is something which will come, but goodness, get in a dream group share your dreams yeah, yeah. and you begin to see how many people are thinking the same thing as you and, and i know a friend of mine who spent many years living with the hopi when she was younger and and they would every morning they would have dream discussions this was this was normal and, and we need to start and the doing australian that. aborigines also yes yes, yes. And it was a fundamental part of of what came through and what messages they had for the tribes and things so, so this is returning and i i i mean we're getting dream events linking with real-time events creating synchronicity which allows us to see the direction of where we're going i mean i've had some phenomenal ones which what got me into young was was was, was things like this and 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 held me to 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 keep looking into his work and and subject so you you're getting guided think, actually no i've got to spend my time doing this and that's happening more and more to people realizing oh my goodness because the thing about synchronicity was you can't make it up two totally disconnected events and yet there is this connection with the message and the meaning for you at the right time or for somebody else by the way so you, you could be at synchronicity to, to help other people to see, see it so um really exciting times yeah so that's really ramping up and i'm also getting the sense that as we can gather in groups and you know for people that can connect with people who have connections to those ancient shamanic traditions. I mean, that can certainly support the process, but also I would imagine for people who, who are really working to open to it on their own, it is, as you said, about surrendering, letting go of the ego or the desire to have some control over the process, allowing yourself to go into more of an altered state of consciousness and allow ourselves to be guided, to remember how to be in right harmony with those relationships, with those energies, and how to be working with them. But with one big difference, the shamanic practitioners who were doing this over the last hundred years, they were doing it on their own, but now mankind is collectively being pushed into the shamanic journey. Yes. So we're not having a choice. We're undergoing this journey right now. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to become a shamanic practitioner. I'm going to start doing a journey, maybe do this intuition. Even, even uh, Jung with his in visualization exercises, looking to go and explore the, uh, what he could find, and which led to amazing things like his, his theory of archetypes and his whole uh, psychoanalytic analytical work. We're not in that moment. We're in a moment where we're moving into group consciousness, where we're in a moment when this energetic environment is is reawakening ourselves and the, the Quero talk about it as um, the Tarape Pacha, the, the, this great spiritual awakening, but they actually talk about refinding ourselves and each other, which is like really beginning to, to, to see how all the worlds are coming together. So this, this journey is something we, we're already on. We've got no choice except for whether we either embrace it and go with the flow 
and, and ride that wave uh, or we don't. And then the result will be whether or not you're going to be ones that are helped or you're going to be the helpers in the next phase. But the, 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 the interesting thing um, is that we don't need everybody. Not every, we can't, we can't, we don't need everybody to be meditating. You know, two or 3% of the world will be sufficient to be able to get this wave spreading. I mean, this, 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 this morphic resonance that Rupert Sheldrake talks about is, is something which, which grows naturally as more and more people. The morphogenic field. Yeah, yeah. And so and the Carol talk about that too in their prophecies, that if only a small number of people can hold that and seed yeah. that in the collective consciousness, the global consciousness will shift. Yeah. We've got over a hundred different sites that last time people were meditating, we had over over probably 1,500 people. It's not great, 1,500 people last uh, at that harmony time on these sacred sites. And when, when we think when we began, nine years ago where there were like less than 10 people and, and, and we've, we've got sites all around America and Europe and, and lots in the UK and they're growing. I mean, we, we literally the last, um, we, we had 70 people, 60, 70 people at, at, at the local stone circle where we were at and uh, we were joined by the cows. I don't know if you know, saw the last newsletter. <laughs> Literally, they, they, they came running down the hill to join us and they ended up lying around the, around the circle, just joining in. Because the just animals feel these energies. Of course they do. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Uh, and, and lots of stories of people finding the connections with birds and different types of birds coming in as well. So there's, there's a lot of ways people are discovering feedback that makes them know, yeah, this is what I should be doing, which is the right thing. So that, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, positive times even, even amongst the sort of adversity we find in the world. <laughs> yeah. So what is your sense of what that shift might be at the end of 2024 if we are, and if enough of us are working to attune to these energies and really support the shift that's happening? What's your sense of what our experience might be as we work with that shift? The the experience will be different for everybody because we're all on different journeys. There are already people who are experiencing things that we will, many of us will get to experience. There, there are people who have uh, difficulties already mentally handling some of these things that, that, that's going on. They don't understand it. They're reporting huge mental difficulties. Psychologists, psych psychiatrists, psychiatrists are having trouble working out why they're seeing and, and they're saying such things. Whereas others who, who are also experiencing these things, things are, are able to um, self-analyze what's going on. Uh, li literally we touched on it earlier where, where you're walking down the street and suddenly you're, you're in a dream. Yeah. And you see something which is absolutely real to you, but it's like a dream and then it disappears again. And, and, and again, you, you, you've got to read Jung to suddenly see, he, he, he experienced the same thing in a city where so he was walking in the city and suddenly he found a knight on horseback charging down at him. <laughs> I mean, and then you can imagine why he thought he was going mad. And then suddenly it's, it's like this phasing in and out of existence of another world. So we're gonna have people who pick these things up before others. They'll experience, I mean, we, we, I can't even begin to say some of these things that people report. I can't prove it, but that's the sort of thing you would expect. Phasing in and out of dreams and reality, hearing things you wouldn't normally hear. Um, but that then begins to allow us to train ourselves to move into a, an individual focused state, to, to disassociate from that, to know what's going on, as opposed to being completely bushwhacked by it, thinking, I must be more mad. I've just seen a camel cross over the zebra, <laughs> zebra crossing you know it's, it's a zebra crossing not a camel crossing you know but you can see how that that people can make people go, go paywire well it's really fascinating rory because my doctoral dissertation as a psychologist was that fine line between mystical experience and psychotic experience so and some of the key is and i think this is part of the challenge in this time is we need to stay grounded so that we can be integrating and understanding this expansive 
uh, spiritual consciousness and these mystical experiences we're going to be opening up to more so that we don't get thrown out of balance by it or overwhelmed by it. 100% that, and, and, and it's about beginning the journey as soon as you can. Yes. Because you will be able to handle it. And again, the reason for these discussions groups that I want to start, and it's about once you've done a discussion group, you can then run them yourself. The guidebooks are there. So you can then expand and help others in your, in your area, and then they can expand. So it's about getting, not knowledge, it's about shared experience. Do you recognize and respect each other's aspects and, and, and what they've gone through? And support and, and you, each other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 um, I, I, I can't really say what else will come along because we need to expect the unexpected. But, but you, it's what you mentioned earlier, I was just reminded of, of something that I heard that Nikola Tesla once said, and I haven't got this quite right, but he said it's, 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 it's a um, normal thinking to be sane, but deep, deeper thinking, you can, you can be allowed to be insane or something like that. It's a, it, 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 there's an aspect of, of maintaining sanity with, with logical thinking, but you, you, with deeper thinking, you, you um, again, a bit like the inner visualizations that Jung experienced is that he came to realize that what was seemingly insane did have a relevance to his the messages coming through for him. Well, and again, this message that you're highlighting, the importance for us to surrender, to open to the, the energies of this time, to support each other in that. It reminds me of that part of the Hopi prophecy of don't cling to the shore, let go, be in the current of the river, see who yeah. else is there. We are the ones we've been waiting for. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you've ever been blown over by a wave, you know, if, you're, if, you, if you, ever, you, you can't fight the wave. Doesn't matter which way up you are, you're going to get spat out at the end. Just, just hold your breath, <laughs> go with it. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much, Rory, for this amazing conversation. And again, your website is roryduff.com. And it sounds like within a few months, you'll have more information for people about where they might be able to go to do these group meditations. And also, it sounds like you're going to be developing materials for people to form their own discussion groups to support each other in working with these energies. Yeah, we've, we've been testing the modules now for over a year with uh, three groups of people from all around the world. And um, we, we're just ironing them out so that they're manageable uh, for others to just pick up off and, and just run them um, but there'll be ways for other people to 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 run events so just put an event marker in and they're going to run a meditation or run run a group gathering somewhere um, what will take a bit longer is to to begin to put in all the sacred sites um, because they do take a while to find i've mapped about half of america's really significant energy lines and europe's significant energy lines and i, I write a I write a bit about some of those on my newsletters, which are available on my website. But we'll, we will eventually have um, as many places as we can, which are accessible, mind you, because mountain tops aren't great for groups. And some of the some of the special places are mountain, but there are others which are, um, like I mentioned one to you, it's certainly easy to get 50 to 100 people in and, and have an amazing experience. And that's that's the first step. And, and as as the Gnostics would say in, in their uh, in their Gnostic Gospels, there's a, a a different viewpoint from the Garden of Eden, where they view the serpent as the instructor, the teacher, and these are serpents are symbolic all around the world. They're the universal symbol for the Earth energy lines, serpents and dragons, and 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 it's about let, letting the energies teach us. That's it. We aren't we aren't instructors. We're we're, we're the pupils. But if you gather around these energy places and connect in groups, the, the information that will come through for you, that there's a whole host of higher beings who are waiting there to help us. We just have to waken up. Well, it's profound. And it is about connecting to those energies in the earth, which are also connecting us to the energies of the sky. And, and as the ancients understood, being in right harmony yeah. with the song of the spheres. 
and just to finally thank you for bringing that up because you know I, I talk about what I'm beginning to understand and only just a bit and that's the earth energies but you're right there's the sky grid sky energies there's there's a huge uh, aspect with trees and and and, uh, and living uh, uh, things they have a network of energies which are also interconnected with what we're doing and there's people who work with those and uh, of course it's all interconnected but it's yeah so I'm just giving you one small aspect of this from, from I know. as I see it so far. Yeah. We could talk for hours, Rory, but I am so grateful for this conversation and for the thank profound you. work that you're doing. So, very, very kind of you to invite me. Thank you very much. Thank you.